Welcome back, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the third match of the day, our sixth match of the week, and our final one that we'll be seeing until next week. I'm Nathan Zamora, and I'm joined by Cora Georgiou. And we once again have been kind of getting the full spectrum of not only decks, but also games that have been panning out so far. Absolutely. We've seen uh, three different kind of warriors up until now. Uh, the shamans have all been kind of similar, but so far it's been some really fantastic matches. And uh, Brown actually taking the first match from the left side <laughs> of the books that you guys uh, saw on the screen. Up until now, it had been four on the right. Yeah, so yes, certainly has been. And uh, we're going to be heading back over to the north for our third and final match of the day. So let's take a look at the specific region breakdown once again. You can see it highlighted in green as schools uh, across the United States and Canada are competing here. And once again, not too much shaping up in the standings. They'll be updated as all the matches have been completed for the week. Uh, but in week two, we are very quickly starting to see some teams set, the size, set themselves apart from the field by getting halfway to that playoff point. Man, after we've been talking for this long, I start saying jies instead of guys. <laughs> the words get twisted, but the gameplay remains ever the same. Uh, still very strong from what we've seen over the last couple of days. Just gotta call me out. I didn't call you out on yours. You know what? That's I fine. was calling you out and at the same time acknowledging myself um, because I want to save my own butt because it's guys, not guys. Yeah, I, I and get it. it's gonna happen more and more. <laughs> Let's take a look at. And you uh, know what? You <laughs> laughed at me yesterday, so this is righteous payback. Can't help it. Ontario Institute of uh, Technology, as you can see it right there, bringing Druid, Shaman, Warrior, and Mage. They'll be taking on St. Louis Farm, bringing Druid, Warlock, Hunter. And shaman. So plenty of variety that we've been seeing throughout the day. Let's take a closer look at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology first. There we can see Scarlet Airy, Blue, and Gabe with education, bit game development, and entrepreneurship on, on two of these people so far. And that's when that's your major, I feel like you're you're in the right spot. That is so cool. Uh, a lot of these majors, I go to a liberal arts college. It's not even a university. Uh, we're not that cool. So a lot of these majors, I've just never seen before. And I say, oh. man, why'd you write it in pencil, dude? Longer. Just hold it there a little bit longer. What was that about? You got to commit to it. You gotta if commit. you're going to go for it, commit to it. Uh, much like dude 7597 and his friend committed to the We Heart Cora sign yesterday. I was yeah. a fan of that. And the mm -hmm. way that he committed to having 7597. Oh yeah! At the end of his name, that's it's also paying off. It's working for him. <laughs> it's a, it's Modern lover certainly thinks so. It, it's been working the out for him so far. The symmetry is beautiful. <laughs> and going into the St. Louis College of Pharmacy, admirable. What do you think these guys major in? Uh, well, probably pharmacy. I mean, considering they're at the St. Louis College of Pharmacy, I'd be I'd be <laughs> a little bit surprised. Uh, something I really like is the names here: Leister uh, and MGRX. Of course, the RX being the uh, pharmaceutical sign, and then the hammer. Forty-four. You want me to put the hammer down? He looks like a hammer. Look at that guy. I like the pink. It's nice. It's a bold button-down choice. I, you know, salmon color is not, not for everyone, but... These are the future pharmacists of America, Admirable. Woo! Every, Beautiful group of men. It's, it's needed. It's a necessary thing. It absolutely is. Well-paying job, too. Now, that I wouldn't know anything about. I know very little. But... but uh, Hashtag caster man. <laughs> Hashtag caster man. <laughs> All right, looking at these class breakdowns, UOIT with the Shaman Warrior Mage, the self ban of the Druid, and St. Louis Farm with the Druid Warlock Shaman and the self ban of the Hunter. Yeah, I, you know, I, I mentioned yes, or earlier today that I, I personally am never self banning my Druid. Um, in this spot, I can see why they did it. They're, they're staring at a Hunter, a Warlock, and a Shaman on the other side, and the mid-range Shamans can at times be a, a bit tough for some Druid builds, so depending on their Druid build, I think is, is more of the influence there, mm -hmm. but I still personally am never locking it away. It, I think it's way too strong. Um, now, the mage, on the other hand, if the mage is a freeze mage, it would make, I think, a little bit more sense mm -hmm. to take care of the druid here. Um, the warrior is just, it's going to be kind of traditionally strong. If you anticipate St. Louis Pharmacy uh, banning away their own hunter, I think it makes sense to keep your warrior around. Um, but the mage, being a freeze mage, I think is would be really important to them winning this match. You know, Zoo Warlock is is so vulnerable to the way that freeze mage plays. Yes. All the mid-range shaman decks right now, I talked about it earlier, combo potential is, is one of their weaknesses right now. Uh, you know, I'm taking a look at, at players like Laughing, for instance, uh, where he's tweeting out builds a freeze mage that says, if you want to beat mid-range shaman, this, this is, is the build the to use it. right now. And, and honestly, if, if that's freeze mage, I think they're going to have a big advantage in this match. And it's especially important because St. Louis Farm does not have the control warrior backing up uh, the rest of their lineup. Right. So the freeze mage being even more effective against that mid-range shaman. And admirable, I think this is the first Reno lock that we've seen over the last two days. Yeah, now last week... Uh, St. Louis Farm, they brought Reno Dragonlock. And I'm curious if this week 
they're bringing the same thing. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, all three of these cards are very telling of Arena Warlock build. But if that dragon element is in there, we're going to see if it's enough of an element to take on the Dragon Warrior itself from UOIT. We saw the power level of this deck in our previous match, and UOIT looking to very much emulate that performance. This is really cool. Dog was actually playing uh, a Reno Dragon Lock. Uh, I'm assuming, which is similar to this, there's there's certainly a couple directions that you can go as far as Reno Dragons, um, but cards like Bookworm were actually proving to be very useful uh, and very flexible in a Reno build such as this. Yeah, he did play it at uh, the One Nation of Gamers event at PAX Prime, where he had an unfortunate showing, to say the least, uh, at that event where he was playing Reno Warlock, but... Uh, it's a deck that, once again, it's very much in the, in the Feast or Famine range, where it's it's a deck that's either going to thrive or it is going to fall by the wayside. And with an Azoth drawn, I believe we are seeing a different twist other than yeah. dragons. But All right. I, I'm, they're keeping us on our toes. I can respect that. Nazoth is, is quite interesting. You know, I'm trying to think of really powerful death rattles that would be included in a build like this. You know, I, I can think of a couple, but they're mostly the neutral ones, like like Sylvanas and Cairn. I, and I don't even know if Cairn would even be that strong in this build. Well, there there's is. Cairn. Um, Infested Torn also potentially. You could put a Loot Hoarder in. So I can definitely see that there are a variety of death rattles that work. And when you're only playing one copy of each, then you might be able to get away with it. So St. Louis Farm, Going with the Earth and Ring Farseer, it's going to neutralize the Alex Raza's champion uh, as far as the damage that it created last turn, but that Fairy War Axe is going to allow it to live through. Yeah, I think this is quickly turning into a troublesome problem for, for St. Louis Farm here. You know, this matchup in particular, I think, is pretty strong for, for most of the Reno Warlock builds, but when they have incredibly strong starts and they have the endgame potential to reload with the Curator, it's certainly a different matchup than it was prior to that card. Oftentimes, you were able to check every single one of their threats, and they just kind of gassed out. Uh, but right here, their hand is quite a bit of utility, and Baron Geddon almost dead in this matchup. Of course, a, a tech that's in there for, for the popularity of, of Totem Shamans right now. But where does this hand go to, to begin really fighting back against what UOIT is going to throw at him? So the only four drop in hand right now is Spellbreaker. Uh, you can play it on the Alexstrasza champion. It becomes a 2-3 again, and then the Fiery War Axe will kill it very easily. Um, so at this point, I'm wondering a little bit how desperately do you need to life tap into better cards? Well, I, I do think that Spellbreaker is the start here. You know, it's an, kind of the unfortunate minus one power to your opponent's minion. Yeah. Um, but, you, you know, they, they have to do what they have to do because the hand right now is so low on resources that I think they have to just hope to draw right. You can see them shaking their head. This is certainly not the position they were envisioning uh, when, they, when they chose this deck. No, it's a really heavy hand, unfortunately. And there are many lower mana cost cards. Uh, Dark Peddler, Imp Gang Bossed, I'm sure, is in the build. So you have resources that you can draw into in the early game. And unfortunately, it's just a very heavy curve. Yeah, no Soulfire either. Soulfire, I think, would have been a fantastic pickup for St. Louis Farm right here, be able to answer the uh, Corcoran Elite and just try to shut down the damage. But at this point, we're very quickly approaching the Reno or Bust stage yeah. of the Reno Warlock build. And when your hand is still this heavy, it's not quite the situation you want to be in. Yeah, and I think that's ultimately why Reno Warlock is not seen in the meta right now. Uh, even Zoo Warlock isn't very favorable, but often that Reno or Bust place, if you do have the Reno, then you can come back from uh, a really you know poor start to the game, but it just feels like it comes down to that far too often. Yeah, th that's one of the reasons that I just personally don't prefer the deck. You know, one of the strongest ways to play against the build because they only have one copy of everything is to go, well, like you have to have it and just hoping they don't have it. And, and because you only have one copy, you oftentimes don't. <laughs> and you know what, St. Louis Farm here choosing to pick the Light Warden instead of the Flame Imp. And I understand you don't want to deal three damage to your face, but Light Warden does absolutely nothing on board. Well, at least Flame Imp challenges the two minions. I, I think I would have liked to see him play it there. I, I think at, at this stage, it is just kind of a downhill effect and they have almost thrown in the towel at this point. It is, once again, very desperate situation. And UOIT, even disrespecting the possibility of Hellfire by attacking mm -hmm. straight to the face. And Infested Torin, I <laughs> it's got a lot of work to do if it's gonna fend this off. Uh, all right, let's see. So, life tap is risky, of course, because you're so low on life. Infested Torin, 
the Corcoran Elite can break through, and then the well, Frothing Berserker the goes face. I don't even know how they live this turn, really. I mean, I guess Tor if that's Torrent's how, but yeah. Like, wh where's your actual recovery mechanic? You when can. You fall into a spot like this? You, like, you what can, do they need to draw? You can Mortal Coil first. Try to draw Hellfire. Kill off Alex Ross as champion. It's brutal. So many I mean, nothing that you're going to do for two mana afterwards is particularly great anyway. Sun Fury Protector is just a 2 3. The Light Warden's going into the Alex Ross's champion regardless if you're not using that Mortal Coil, so I think you have to draw first. I, I think I agree with you in this spot, too. Hellfire also could be like the miracle draw. Being able to run Light Warden into the Frothing Berserker and then uh, clean up afterwards. Demon Wrath, even though it is. Mm -hmm. It's it's a redundancy effect. It is just shy of being able to get the job done here. So U O I T. They have so many good cards in hand. It's, it's a lot. Uh, coining into curator gives them another dragon and a fierce monkey in hand. Now, the only thing I don't want to see from them this turn is an expenditure of blood to Icker. I feel mm -hmm. with Grom and blood to Icker, they have all but a shoe in to win the game at this point. Yes. I mean, that is if St. Louis Farm does not draw into that Reno sure, Jackson. I'm curious if this is actually ever lethal ever, if they play Sir Finley Mergleton, if they blood to Icker or something, that would bring the Frothing Berserker up to six, and then Ravaging Ghoul would deal six mm -hmm. damage to the boards. And that then would bring Fire Blast up could to kill off the Tauren, and then well, you, you would go just, face. Then you could just use the... Um, yeah, they actually, I think they missed lethal this turn. So if you play Sir Finley Mergleton, and then you blood to Icker anything... Um, you create a sixth minion on board. Then you play Ravaging Ghoul. So the Blood to Icker brought the Frothing Berserker to six. The Ravaging Ghoul brings the Frothing Berserker to 12. The trade of the Core Crown Elite brings it to 14. And then you attack face. So well, even if... So they had Dagger Mastery, right? You could have played the Finley, get Dagger Mastery. Blood to Icker on the Torin, Ravaging Ghoul, Hero Power, Dagger Mastery in, and then you had the Core Crown and the Frothing to go face. And I think that's even just... There's, more than you need. Yeah, there's there's multiple ways to do that turn, yeah. and, and it's inconsequential here because St. Louis Farm just doesn't have a way to get back into the game. Um, I don't think. I no, and UOIT would have needed to use the coin, but at seven mana, uh, I do believe that that would have been lethal. And with no Reno Jackson draw, it's not going to matter. I'm yeah, trying the best they can. But at the end of the day, the extra damage that is brought from just a Gromish Hell Scream in his. Not so angry for him. Timid Grom. He's, he's a little tame still. Uh, he's just kind of happy to be here. He's happy I'm he was invited to the party. Getting and now, close now to the holidays. He's, exactly. Maybe he's a Christmas guy. Who knows? Maybe he's one of those cosplayers. Just can't quite get the character down, Pat. Ah. Either way, UOIT is taking a 1 0 lead in this series uh, on the back of an incredibly powerful Dragon Warrior deck and St. Louis Farm lacking the tools to ever gain any leverage in this one. Yep, UOIT just completely in control of that matchup. And St. Louis Farm is going to have to find a win with their Reno Warlock at some point in this match if they actually want to win because best of five conquest. So it starts to keep you wondering with the self ban format, I mean, they must have thought that this Warlock deck was strong. Well, anytime you're going to bring a deck, it's, it's because it's something that you believe in, unless you're just competing for the good old sake of doing so, which is totally fine. But uh, I feel like every time that I'm looking at a Reno Warlock deck inside of a lineup, outside of some very select tournaments that, that I've seen, mm -hmm. I feel like it's, it's a big liability and a, and a big weakness of, of the lineup, and especially in a self ban format where you, you're not able to control what your opponent's playing. You know, Oftentimes you bring a Reno Warlock deck, you intend to ban Shaman from your opponent. You don't have that liberty in this format, it's a self ban instead. And so in that position, if you're going to bring Reno Warlock, you should anticipate self banning it a lot. But Shaman's so popular that what would be the purpose of that? And, and and in this situation, I honestly, the the Warrior matchup, I think, is still strong for them. Yeah. They just didn't draw the tools to do it, and that's just part of the Reno-Jackson deck is that you will have a lot of inconsistencies. You know, and as much as I love to see ingenuity in a lineup, at the end of the day, you have to think, they brought Hunter and Warlock instead of a Warrior. And Warrior is the most picked uh, class mine. in this tournament, so... Could their chances of winning have been better if they had just gotten rid of one of those for the Warrior? We can't possibly know that, but certainly the Warriors have proven themselves very consistent. Uh, so UOIT going to go into the second game with actually the first Tempo Mage we've seen today. And St. Louis Farm going to queue back with that Nizoth Arena Lock. Yeah, running it back. And this, this matchup is a really interesting one where 
Uh, depending on how the exact Tempo Mage deck is built, they either are going to need to get off to the races very early, or they can kind of play a, a burn game plan where they're trying to just get enough damage in and then eventually deliver the final blow with multiple burn spells. So depending on how they've actually chosen to build it specifically, I think influences their game plan a lot. And with this kind of opening hand, these are all found in Tempo Mage builds, so we don't quite have that information. How they approach their first few turns, um, again, it's kind of just set out for them right now. It's going really to be difficult to get some information until we see some more stuff here. As psychic as we like to think we are sometimes, unfortunately, we are limited by what we can see on this screen, uh, even though we can see both players' hands, so we have more information than usual. Um, but UOIT, the Tempo Mage has seen some interesting tech choices recently, um, so much as yesterday one of the teams had double flame strike, double Cabalist Tome. It was a very heavy Tempo Mage. Uh, that I believe ran Mediv as well. Yeah. So interesting to see with the first Cabal's Tome in hand if this is going to be reminiscent of that deck or maybe a little bit more aggressive. Yeah, with Cabal's Tome in the build in general, I would tend to say it's one that wants to get off to the races very quickly. And when your opponent exhausts their resources answering your board state, it's it, you hope that you have a window of opportunity to actually yeah, use Cabal's Tome. Doomsayer here, a very interesting draw, but this is incredibly weak to so much of UIT's range. Frostbolt's one of them, but even without the Frostbolt, the Arcane Missiles would buff the Banner Worm up to two, and so a single missile hitting the Doomsayer would take care of it. It would have been nice to have it on turn one, they would have expended coin, but in this situation, they are literally at the mercy of UIT not having a burn spell. Which, if you know anything about Tempo Mage... They usually got them. Yeah. Uh, and UOIT right now, uh, their curve looks fantastic because of the Sorcerer's Apprentice. If this lives through the next turn, then they've got Cabal's Tome on four into Drake on five. But St. Louis Farm does have uh, Demon Wrath and Mortal Coil in hand, so all signs point to them clearing this board. But then they're forced to expend their coin, uh, which means their curve becomes a little bit more awkward. Yeah, I, I don't know if coining the Mortal Coil is 100% necessary. I think I like it because Mana Worm is just such an important card, but Having the Demon Wrath here is really important. The fact that it sets up the Mortal Coil and that it takes out the Sorcerer's Apprentice here, I don't necessarily think they're anticipating Cabalus Tome, but mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's just kind of an undetended consequence of that card is that is UIT's hand without that Sorcerer's Apprentice is going to be clunky. Absolutely. So St. Louis, I think the Demon Wrath needs to come down this turn. You can't really leave Sorcerer's Apprentice on the board it's uh, certainly a priority threat. But the Mana Worm is also very threatening. So I, I don't disagree with just Demon Wrath. I also don't disagree with Demon Wrath Coin Mortal Coil. It digs you deeper into your deck. Uh, and you certainly got some nice four drops in the form of Infested Tauren. Uh, you've got that Spellbreaker even. So digging is always a good thing, especially in a matchup against a deck so aggressive. I think it boils down to just what their density of draws looks like around this mana slot. And, and given that it's an Azoth build, I would tend to say it's a little bit more on the high side. So digging here probably is a tad weaker. Now, you do give up some damage, but th the potential payoff for it um, of being able to have coin on and roll into a six drop on turn five and yeah. then a six drop on turn six, I think is way more important than trying to find a significant drop for the next turn. And ultimately, if they don't Let's draw anything magic. that they can play for four mana on the following turn, you can always Mortal Coil Mana Worm next turn. Yeah. So, cost of life, but options for future. And a weak turn from universe, I'm sorry, from UOIT is exactly what St. Louis Farm is looking for. And you know what, when you're playing a Reno Warlock, the one thing that you do have the liberty of playing with, assuming you get the Reno Jackson, is your life total. Yes. And more heavy cards added to hand. It's, it's looking very similar to last game, but UOIT does not apply the same kind of pressure with this build. It's more of a critical mass style than it is uh, just big things that attack a lot. Big things that attack a lot, and cards that draw stuff. Uh, so Acidic Swamp is coming down. It challenges the Cult Sorcerer, and it makes UOIT's turn five a little bit awkward, because if they want to either play the Cabalist Tome or the Drake, then they are uh, risking that Cult Sorcerer on the following turn. Yeah, this is it's such an awkward turn. I mean, the, here's the deal. They could protect the Cult Sorcerer, but with Cabalist Tome and Azure Drake, I think they have more than enough gas to kind of make a bit of a sacrifice here and try to build towards something bigger. To do. Now, Arcane Missile's to incredibly do. high chance to actually succeed, but you're foregoing an Azure Drake or a Cabalist Tome in this spot, and this is the kind of development that I think could be very costly to them in, in future turns. I would have loved to see the Cabalist Tome here, just because 
Uh, it's so difficult to find a turn where you can play that Cabalist Tome and not put yourself in a losing position at the same time. Uh, so if they had traded in that Cult Sorcerer, or even gone face, and then played the Cabalist Tome, they would have most likely uh, been able to catch up on board on the following turn. So St. Louis Farm going with the Emperor Thoris on instead of the Cairn Bloodhoof. You are shaking your head, Admirable. Well, I, it, the Cairn here is going to play so much stronger onto the board. I mean, if you look at the way their curve's panning out, Fireball is one of the disasters they run into. I mean, UIT very lucky to draw it, but if you just think about how on earth you're going to lose this game, it's going to be from this Cold Sorcerer getting in multiple hits at this point. This is now six damage it's bought. Um, and this is the whole reason they choose to go with this play was to try to unlock that potential. So suddenly, even though they have a big discount here, yes, they have the Cairn plus the Sun Fury Protector to, to make sure they block that. Um, I, I feel like this situation would have been much stronger on board by protecting their life total, uh, personally. So, I mean, maybe they had intentions of playing the Baron Geddon this turn, so but many that's, a, that's a risky proposition right now. The thing is, if you're playing down the Cairn, then the Cult Sorcerer most likely will just not be there next turn. So Baron Geddon... Yeah, UOIT's got a lot of two health minions, but rolling into the later game, you're going to be seeing more of those mid-range minions that Baron Gun's not as effective against. Well, this is certainly a risk. There's, I mean, there's only one card that heals in St. Louis Farm hands right now, and it requires your opponent to have minions on board. And in my, if I'm in UOIT's spot, I'm looking at this and going, I think Cabalist Tome to dig for burn is probably one of the better options. Absolutely. I also don't dislike Sorcerer's Apprentice. Uh, into the Cabalist Tome on this turn. I don't think it's personally necessary, wow, but... Wow, that's a good one. It is. It will prevent seven damage, but then... Uh, Protects the Azure Drake, too. Yes, even more importantly. Especially since UOIT is still at 28 health. They're not worried about huge amounts of burst damage from St. Louis Farm. Um, unless they're running something oh, like the Leroy Power Overwhelming Faceless combo. Which is Power Overwhelming in here, but that could just be to enable... Uh, Sylvanas steals and to enable um, bigger turns with, with just Shadow Flame in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I would have liked Cabalist Tome there because St. Louis Farm is so low. You've already used one Fireball, but if you were to pick up that second Fireball from Cabalist Tome and then maybe even draw into uh, the other one in your deck, you're going into eight mana. So that would have been one way to close out the game early. Uh, it's I obviously not guaranteed. Saying. Well, the Possessed Villager is kind of a nice pickup here, too. Uh, at this point, honestly, something I'd be looking at is is how I actually get to a winning position purely. And I think it's just going to be sticking something to the board and using Power Overwhelming. Like, they are, they're very far behind right now, and the Baron Geddon is going to continue to compound that issue. Uh, th the fact that UIT chose to just build tension and say, yeah, if you want to attack my Azure Drake, go ahead. I'll just hero power the Baron Geddon if mm -hmm. I need to. This was actually kind of a brilliant play from them, where they realized seven damage... Isn't that consequential? It doesn't mean anything right now. Man, do they feel the need to play the Cult Apothecary for two health? It puts them out of range of double fireball, but they've seen one already. So sort that, of. I don't think that that should be... Well, I, I think, again, I think they're just trying to get enough damage on the yeah. board they can make a push here. Try to close the game out within two turns. Yeah, um, but the Geddon's very gonna far off of that. take the Peddler and the Possessed Villager off the board. Yep. This, this, I don't know if this is a lead with Cabalist Tome or Babbling Book here. Um, Cabalist what can Tome. you do with three mana that you can't do for two? Uh, Frost Nova? Yeah, I mean, Frost Nova is a really big one. Spellbender is not going to be any help here, I don't believe. Babbling right. Book, one of the newer cards in the Mage class. Battlecry, add a random Mage spell to your hand. Uh, it's pretty solid. There's been a little bit of controversy around whether or not it's worth it. But ultimately, I've enjoyed playing with it so far. Well, they get a second Cabalist Tome, but that's not really the situation you want to be in. And Mirror Image, I still think, is doing a strong job here of, of just holding off some of the board pressure. Uh, the Polymorphs, I think, can come in handy later on, but ideally, I think UIT just, just drew burn spells there. If UIT plays down the Mirror Image this turn, then uh, St. Louis Farm might actually be killing I off won. their own board on the following turn. Time runs out on me. Yeah, this is not a strong spot for St. Louis Farm. I mean, it's... UIT, even despite the fact their options are very weak, they're strong enough. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something to really be thinking about as we roll into a couple of these turns. So I think that Life Tap might actually be close to a necessity here. But we'll see, we'll see how they choose to play this. I mean, they may just be fearing Life Tap as just not very strong and, and putting mm -hmm. them closer to death, but 
Puts them at nine, which means Fireball Frostbolt would be lethal. Like I look at this spot and I go, and I go, I need to draw Reno Jackson. And I need to draw oh yeah, him. right now. Yeah, as soon as possible. But now, now you definitely don't life tap. If you're playing the cannon first, life taps off the menu. Mm -hmm. You would only life tap because at eight mana you can life tap and then draw into Reno Jackson. Play that, heal back up to 30, and then potentially stabilize from there. But UOIT's got such a large hand. And obviously, we know they have another Kabbalah Stone, which will only increase uh, the options that they have going into the next couple of turns. It's in finite value. In finite to... <laughs> value. Now, your mana, on the other hand. Not in finite. It's, it's, it's a bit restrictive. Very finite, indeed. Very finite. I uh, so I like a Polymorph on the Cairn here. I think that's a really good like target for it. I think I like just going for the win. A Pyroblast here would be a win. And just more utility. Fortunately, two pretty weak Cabalist jumps. So Polymorph still follows up on it. A very safe life total for UIOT. Any life is breathing room for St. Louis Farm right now. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel about tapping and then into the refreshment vendor? Uh, I, I, I would have tapped last turn, personally. Yep. So I, I'm definitely liking to tap this turn. And when they draw, when they drew the heal, I think that influenced it a lot. Mm -hmm. It keeps them out of double fireball hero power range, which is actually no, it, it's still death to double fireball hero power. Yeah, but I, th I think the way that they, they're seeing these turns pan out, that despite the fact that UIT has such a huge hand, they're not quite that uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Like they, they are starting to mount some pressure, but when your opponent is Cabalist homing and they're not b throwing burn spells to your face when you're so low. It's probably because they have a lot of utility in their hand. Probably because they've got board clear. Someday I'll be just like you. So, UOIT Sorcerer's Apprentice, and there's that board clear. Yep. Spellbender actually uh, could really mess with the Shadow Flame, or the Power Overwhelming for that matter. Is it when you target uh, any minion or just an enemy minion? No, it is any minion because it steals Blessing of Kings. Yes. Oh, interesting. Uh huh. Oh, that's weird. It's kind of cool, though. I actually don't think I've encountered that before. I think that's the way it works. I'm uh, in St. Louis's farm spot really here. Hope. Here's the deal. That's that spellbender. St. Louis farm doesn't know it's spellbender. It could yep. be. It could be any mage secret now. It's from Cabal Stone. They're checking for mirror entity first. I think this is smart, but it's, it's kind of a weird spot that they fell into, <laughs> having to respect um, a potential mirror entity there. I think you really want the two taunt minions here. And yeah, you want to respect Mirror Entity, but at the same time, it's just as likely to be Duplicate or Effigy or any of the other mage spells. So that second taunt minion would be really nice. I have no time for games. And ultimately deciding to forego the, deciding to forego the Mountain Giant this turn, meaning that it's likely to not get played at this point. Arc Mage Antonitis gets drawn. That's just about going to spell That means doom. two fireballs. And in this position, it actually means three because there's Polymorph, Mirror Image, and Arcane Blast. Could be four with Forbidden, Forbidden Flame. Flame. Why not? St. Louis Farm is going to need Reno Jackson, and they're going to need a way to deal with Archmage also. And that, that is an incredibly tall task when this board is being amassed. That almost rhymed. I liked that. Well done. Thank you. And well done by UOIT. I'm definitely playing the, the zero cost spells here. I think fireballs are oh, yeah. way more important than arcane blast. And arcane blast, right forbidden flame. They're not gonna be useful mm. going into it. So, wow, mm. I, I'm pretty surprised by that. I would have absolutely arcane blasted the sheep. Oh. That's a scary sheep. It is Reno or bust. And even Amen. with Reno, it's sometimes bust. Even then, if UOIT had two more fireballs in hand, I would say that it would not be enough. Um, but because they decided to forego, Harvest Golem's not going to be enough. Yep, 2-0 lead for UOIT coming up. And the, once again, the Reno Warlock deck begins to struggle. I don't think that St. Louis Farm is 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 really struggling in terms of the in-game play. It is just the choice of the build is certainly not performing. High fives all around. How could you not be excited? Tempo Mage can sometimes be a tough win against Reno Warlock builds. If you don't get a lot of pressure going and they have some big swing turns, you'll find yourself in a lot of trouble. And in this game, they had no pressure against them. They had so much time to use Cabalist Tomes and then access value from just the utility they drew from it. Yeah, and at the same time, they were able to expand their hand and expand the reach of their deck with those Cabalist Tomes, but not drawing the burn that they needed. So it was kind of an interesting couple of turns where neither 
team was really putting that much pressure on the other one. Uh, ultimately, Archmage Antonidas closed out that game, and now UOIT needing only a win with their Shaman. Yeah, and, and I think here's the deal. With Shamans moving more towards the mid-range, I do think that Reno Warlock has a very strong place in that matchup. Mm -hmm. Shadow Flame is an absolute beast when it comes to that particular matchup, and Twisting Nether can also do a massive amount of work. Uh, the Druid build, I think, is is a little bit up in the air. I think it's going to depend on on where we see the Druid land. If you're relying on Ancients of War to be your mm -hmm. defense, Hex is certainly a monster. Uh, and then the Shaman matchup, that's anyone's guess. So I think the Wicked Witch Doctor does have a, a tad of an advantage when it comes to Shaman. Uh, in speaking of those matchups, but is that stronger versus all the other builds? So uh, I think a comeback here is is still realistic, but um, this is really, I think, the matchup they wanted with Reno Jackson. Oh, and look who Keep makes it. an appearance, finally. You do not throw that away. It's one of the only instances where you're going to keep a card of that high of a mana cost, but as you've seen from the last couple of games, when he's in the deck, he doesn't like coming in your hand. Typically, if you name a deck after a card, it's a card that you that you want to keep. Like I, I, I personally am not gonna build, uh, mana worm bro, mana worm, mana worm broke. The that'd be good. Mana worm that's mage, so good. and be like, hey, you know what? I think I'll mulligan this, uh, this mana worm away. I mean, freeze we, mage is about the only deck I think we I can justify. Do it. name deck, you know, like Nazoth warrior, Cthulhu warrior, and we don't keep those guys. So there are some. Speak for yourself. Speak for yourself. I keep my ten. That's drops. why I have thirty percent win rates with those decks. It's risky. <laughs> Sometimes but you just I can keep respect 10 cost it. Cards. Hey, you know, if that's the way that you feel. I'm sticking to my guns on this one. I even though I've been trapped in my own language. Thanks, Cora. I'm not in a place to disagree <laughs> under any means. <laughs> hey, look at Tunnel Trogs on the board. That's cool. Doomsayer's a pretty good one into that as well. Um, this is an interesting spot for St. Louis Farm. A lot of times players will tend to get a little bit greedy here, and they try to get extra value out of Doomsayer. One of the most prominent values of Doomsayer is buying back tempo from your opponent and delaying their drops. So in this spot, even though Doomsayer is only getting a one-for-one one and has a potential to get better than a one-for-one, one, the thing about it is you buy time. The time is what's important. Absolutely. And Hellfire, uh, really nice in the hand. We haven't seen it up until now. Uh, you saw Shadow Flame, which can be a little bit slow, especially when this deck has trouble uh, advancing onto the board. So Hellfire might be a nice comeback mechanic for them. And then Twisting Nether obviously is the best board removal in the deck, but it is coming very late into the game. Yeah, very nice draw for St. Louis Farm. This is one of the reasons that Doomsayer is so good. Getting presents on board after this is just such a great feeling. Wow, they're going to forego it. That's very interesting. Um, I'm really surprised by that. Usually when you see a nice three drop come into your hand, you like to play it well, I on turn three. This could just be considerations for, mm -hmm. for Feral Spirit, but I feel like Hellfiring and, and getting a 2-1 afterwards is pretty good. It's still not bad. Uh, I mean, that would be checked by Spirit Claws, but I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. And maybe they feel like they can play with their life total. They have Reno Jackson. Uh, mm -hmm. And the way that they're going to win this matchup is with a larger hand. It definitely could be a possibility. I mean, I don't mind the life tap. I'm just I'm surprised. Yeah, it's not something I would have done. I always like playing stuff. I, I I took a note out of Firebat's book when I saw him just play stuff every single time. It, he's such a unique player to watch because yeah. it's almost like he's not doing anything special. Because he just, Clearly pl he just he is. plays the best card in his hand every time. I mean, he's just a smart guy, and now he's going to take our casting jobs, and man, future's looking bleak, admirable. Wow, that's a, <laughs> that's a pretty I'm good sure, draw I'm as well. No comment. Uh, uh, we're going <laughs> to roll through the rest of this turn. But Nice and dandy. Harvest Golem, Power Overwhelming, I feel like it's not bad either. Do you want to clear up that Totem Golem? I, don't, I actually don't know here. This is a weird turn. I've been wrong before. Going to be wrong it's in the future. It's honestly kind of a hard one here, because I think you could sometimes justify Hellfire here, too. But yeah. Hellfire, I think, is, is a much better card that when you're kind of falling behind on board, like if you can catch a flame tongue in it, it's going to be really strong value. In this spot, just building board tension, I think, is strong enough. And they're just looking for a, a better turn in the future. I mean, St. Louis Farm won't necessarily have a strong play into this. And, and they might even catch more value now. Second totem goal gets drawn. And when your opponent doesn't take a strong Hellfire turn, that's usually a signal to the other player that that's not in the hand. Um, so UIT could very much read this situation as there is no Hellfire, now's the time to strike. I yeah, and if that's the case, that. Flame Tongue Totem, they can get a nice trade uh, from the Totem Golem onto the 3-5 minion, but then 
Yeah, Spirit Claws, they could clear off the Possessed Villager as well as the Death Rattle. Um, but then Hellfire would punish that really well. I don't know if UIT has a way to get out of this without getting punished. Hmm. What to do? You know, their per again, their mm -hmm. perspective, I think, is is Hellfire in this hand. Mm -hmm. Maybe and it's when Shadow it's, Flame? When it's only one of 30 cards in the deck, more often than not, it's, it's not in the hand. Little time. Oh, what a tough turn. I'm glad I'm not in UIT spot. They will elect to take their trade, which to me spells a, a tad of a fear of Shadow Flame, so they're kind of hedging their bets here. They're still extending their board presence, but it's not by so much that... Um, it's not by so much that they're getting devastated by AoE. And you know what? This does still put UOIT in the position to refill the board before St. Louis Farm does. So it's, it's St. Louis Farm getting a... Or not. Ooh, that's a nice draw. Okay. Acidic Swamp Ooze matches up so well versus Spirit Claws. I, I played so much Acidic Swamp Ooze right when uh, the metagame had rotated mm -hmm. because my whole goal was to have to see my Shaman opponents play Spirit Claws and pass and then Acidic Swamp Ooze it. Yeah, I mean, we've seen Acidic Swamp Ooze, Harrison Jones coming back into the meta. I maybe wouldn't even be surprised to see both in this deck. I think if you're running the Ooze, it's, it's enough, but... I, I don't hate both. Yeah, I mean, the ooze is, is a lot of times there just to function as a 3-2 as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, You need that early game. Exactly. The Reno decks just don't have a lot of ways to really gas back up. Fire Elemental, certainly one of the stronger ways for UIT to get on board right now. This is uh, very strong against most of St. Louis Farms. Now, not very strong versus Power Overwhelming, but... Let's see. So Power Overwhelming... Siphon Salt might just be good enough here, though. Yeah, it's brings you back up to twenty three. I, I will ex the one reason I don't like the siphon soul here is is simply because uh, of Thunder Bluff Valiant. Mm -hmm. It's a direct answer to that card. You're not getting a life tap if you choose to play Siphon Soul. Here they have power overwhelming harvest golem life tap available to them. Yes. Um I think I'd like to see that play. Siphon Soul is, is certainly very efficient in terms of a one for one answer, mm -hmm. but but St. Louis Farm has been making some interesting decisions up until now. So, I mean, who really knows what they're going to go with? They, they see that there are plenty of alternate lines of play in their hand, but they're not really going with the most obvious play a lot yeah. of the time. I mean, they, they, these decisions, are, they're very similar in approach, but they lead to two very different roads. And I think that's really the important distinction to make, is that when they keep Siphon Soul, it's for Thunder Bluff Valiant. Mm -hmm. It's for per, perhaps like a surprise Alec here out of nowhere. Um, the Power Overwhelming is a difficult card to use. And to see Thunderbluff Valiant and be forced to respond with something like a Twisting Nether, uh, because, I mean, obviously it's just a very high priority target and it has the, the potential to fill a board very quickly and very strongly. Uh, to be able to keep that Twisting Nether and instead use the Siphon Soul, potentially develop your own board after that, it's really nice. So it's a push for UIT. And St. Louis Farm will drop down to a bit of a lower life total here, but I think that's perfectly fine for them. The burst damage potential comes is unlocked by having a board with Shaman right now. It is no, it's no longer the Lava Burst, Doom Hammers, and Rock Biters, oh my. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is board presence. And so Hellfire, Mortal Coil is incredibly strong right now. We've seen the Lions, we've seen the Tigers, we've seen the Bears today. But what we haven't seen is the, the Doom Hammers, the Rock Biters, <laughs> and the Lava Bursts. They will oh actually, my. they're actually going to choose to go with uh, what looks like board development with Earthenry Farseer rather than use the Mortal Coil. Uh, this does cut the 2-1 out of the range, but I don't, I don't mind this. I think that, that here they're trying to just make sure they're safe from anything, which they 100% are, and their hand is so strong afterwards. This is, this is more the games that they were looking for and, and kind of illustrating why this deck is so strong against Shaman in particular. They need board presence to burst. Yeah, and you were saying the reverse sweep is certainly possible for St. Louis Farm. They needed to get this deck out of the way. So keeping Reno Jackson in the early hand was absolutely what they needed to do. And now that they've exhibited great patience, uh, saving the Hellfire for the best possible turn, they've cleared the board, put themselves at a safe life total, and they just have hard removal. They have 30, well, 29 health gain, essentially. Um, That's the best case scenario. So uh, it's going to be very hard for UOIT to win this game. Very much rewarded for saving the Mortal Coil here and, and not relying on the 2-1 to be the board presence. Now suddenly they get to check the next threat from UOIT and then develop on their own. This is perfect for St. Louis Farm. Everything's going their way this game. 
Yeah, and that mountain giant, something we haven't seen in the Warlock decks uh, in quite a while. But 7 mana, 8-8, eight, eight, you've got better options nowadays, but it's, it's still not terrible. It's no 4 mana, 7-7. Seven, seven. No, it's certainly not. It's no 0 mana, 5-5. Five, five. It's isn't even a good card anymore. I can't even Yo, remember last time I saw Flame Reef. Man, the meta is so strange. Shaman's just... Hashtag Hex. It's an embarrassment of riches. Yeah, but I mean, the Mountain Giant comes down. UOIT checks with Hex. They've got nothing else in yeah, their I, hand, really. They're still favoring the life taps here, which I actually like. I mean, a lot of times I, I don't like when players are so greedy with resources, but I think in this spot, uh, getting the most value out of it to unlock Reno Jackson is, is is totally reasonable. I think that the Twilight Drake often enough can force a Hex here, which mm -hmm. can open up a stronger threat later on. This is a, still a very strong play from St. Louis Farm. Yeah, and it shows that St. Louis Farm knows exactly what their opponent is playing, uh, because at 11 health, against any other Shaman, I'd be really hesitant to keep dealing damage to myself. Uh, but St. Louis Farm knows that the burst damage is just not there from UIT if there isn't a board built up, so they are simply not worried. Yeah, no reason to be. And it's, UIT's got very staggered hand right now. Nothing is really working uh, together. It's just hope that mm -hmm. they draw. I mean, I don't even know what they could draw to get back in the game at this point. I mean, I think this has to be a Hex and a Mana Tide. Uh, you can't leave the 4-7 on board, and they don't know to expect a Mountain Giant from St. Louis Farm. I mean, they know to expect something, but I do agree that Mana Tide is probably going to need to get multiple draws here. And Argent Squire is not the start not they're looking one for. Of them. Now, this turn in particular, I think is going to be interesting. With the frog down, are they going to continue to life tap? And they are. I don't think it's getting better than that one. Well, safety first. Deciding to pull the trigger in Reno Jackson uh, with nine health remaining. I mean, it's what the deck's all about. <laughs> Rich indeed. Yeah, UITs, this is, <laughs> this is, about as close to losing as it gets without actually losing. I mean, once you see Reno Jackson come down, if the Warlock has board and has any semblance of a hand, I, uh, you can't really win. I mean, it's it's, yeah, it's very just much, too difficult. This is it's very uh, similar to some of the matchups that we saw earlier today where it's 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 an aggressor versus a defender, but the, the battle isn't over life totals as much as it is over resources. And so St. Louis Farm, just being able to leverage life tap for as long as they have, uh, it, it spends their life. And then being able to restore it with Reno Jackson means that if they at all stabilize, they end up with a massive advantage on the resource battle. Little time. UOIT deciding, do they want to yeah. save anything in their hand or do they want to put it all onto the board right now? I mean, you kind of have to go for a big board push. I, th I think it's really your only way of winning. Um, obviously, that's checked by Shadow Flame, by Twisting Nether. By just about everything you can imagine. Even Geddon does a nice job. Yeah, I, th I think I like Twisting Nether here. Just overall strong. I mean, Demon Wrath, Baron Geddon's totally Gedden. fine too, yeah. It allows you to develop a 7 5. It is important to certainly be pushing threats right now. Yeah, that's what they're going to opt for. See you later, board. And burn it will. Ragnaros is pretty good in his own right, but sometimes Baron Geddon. <laughs> it's pretty good, too. It's all right. It's best. Kill your whole board. When you have them together. I have a 7-5. Doesn't suck. It's okay. It's not bad. It's not golden. Could be better. I actually don't think I've ever seen a golden Baron Geddon. I can show you one later. I Pulled one from a pack about a year and a half ago, Admirable. It was a happy day. I'm jealous. Have not gotten <laughs> many since then. Uh, but the Geddon is... I'm pretty proud of him. Baron Board Clear, as I like to call him a lot of the time. Baron not sure why. Clear. Don't know where I got it. What about what, what, when he doesn't clear the board? It's in his name, just ironic Baron then. Disappointment. <laughs> yep. That's him then. Baron, I wish you were... I, I feel like Vaughn should be in between strike. that name. Baron Vaughn... Disappointment, bad. yeah. Yeah. It feels... Baron Vaughn feels bad. That's, that's, what it, that's what it's like to have lunch with me. Oh. It's Baron Vaughn Disappointment. Fire Elemental <laughs> going to finally hit the board here. It is UIT just with an extreme lack of options or direction at this point. Three to face because getting... You're hoping it's going to trade. 
St. Louis Farm has got it all. Siphon Soul into Infested Torrent, and this one is all but over. Deal seven to face, even remove the healing totem at the end of the turn. Thunderbluff Bluff Valiant typically a pretty good card. Not when your opponent is Baron Geddon. It's a shame. It's a disappointment. But, uh, but I mean, okay. So we're seeing plenty more Thunderbluff Valiant than we are seeing Baron Geddon. So which one are you really rooting for here? I tend to root for the underdog, and I feel like the Reno Warlock playing the Baron Geddon is definitely the underdog here. <laughs> I'm rooting for game number four right now. This one's over. This one's yes, done. Yes, absolutely. It's well done. I don't order anything well done. This is a stake that a little burnt from the Baron Geddon. You ever, you ever see those people at restaurants that get well done steak? Yeah. I'm like, dude, you just bought a filet. I mean, here's just, the thing. You just turned a filet into a hamburger. I enjoy that charred well taste. I don't enjoy <laughs> the toughness when you get it well done. Uh, but St. Louis Farm certainly uh, has a, probably a better taste in their mouth right now because they finally <laughs> got a game on the board. I was wondering I'm trying where you were going to go I'm with trying that. to bring it back to restaurants, man. You set me up, and it was really hard, but I... I Tried. It, I mean, I, that game was, I haven't was been perfectly. Doing this for too long. Game was perfectly executed by St. Louis Farm. Absolutely. This one. And, and that's kind of the illustration of more where they project the Reno Warlock deck to be. You know, the, the aggressive decks are still there, but it's not quite in the same numbers as we were seeing prior to Tusker Totemic getting changed and Rockbiter getting changed and the like. Um, and and now getting a win with it, there's some breathing room here. And and they know the matchup 100% at this point. They mm -hmm. know it's not a Wicked Witch Doctor build that can help them shape some of the game plans of their other decks. And so. That, that's a little bit of an important one. Again, I think the Reno Warlock decks are going to perform very well versus either of the varieties. Uh, but now they can they can kind of shape their mulligans with Druid. They can they can understand where they need to dedicate resources in that Shaman matchup. I, I honestly can see them really coming back in this one. You know, there's times where where I never see it happening. Mm. This is this isn't one of them. This is one where it is certainly possible. Uh, and that Reno Warlock game is one that. You know, occasionally you come across those games that you just kind of want to go back and look at, that you want to rewatch and really follow uh, the mindset every step of the way, because there were some interesting turns there that, you know, I personally didn't see, uh, you know, right off the bat. It didn't. It wasn't the obvious play, and they ended up showing great patience and making the right plays in the long run. So that one was very impressive for St. Louis Farm. Totem Golem on the open for UIT is they have to run Shaman back. It is the last deck they need to win with in St. Louis Farm. Uh, opening up with Raven Idol, Mire Keeper, Innervate. This Arcane Giant is certainly hitting the bin for now. I'm curious if they're keeping this Mire Keeper, though. I mean, turn turn one or turn two Mire Keeper is certainly a play that can really establish a board versus Shaman. Yeah, it's very nice. The 3 3 challenges uh, the early tunnel trogs. It, obviously, not as good against the Totem Golem. But Ooh, it's a Flame Wreathed Faceless That admirable. is a Fandral. That is turn one Fandral potential for St. Louis Farm. And. That is super important for them. This this is one of the ways that Druid can win this matchup is by having Innervate and plays to follow it up. And they also have Violet Teacher now, so I'm going to be really curious to see which direction they take. All right, so Coin Innervate Fandral gets you, you know, awesome Raven Idol. Um, the Coin Innervate Violet Teacher, you don't have any follow-up for that the thing, but you also don't have follow-up for the Fandral. So which one benefits more from the Raven Idol? So the Violet Teacher is going to be a little bit weaker to Maelstrom Portal, I think. Uh, and so more of their direction, I would say, is to try to couple that with Power of the Wild. Um, so I, I think the Fandral is a little bit better here. Not only that, but the Fandral kind of can incite some panic from UOIT in this situation. Uh, Raven Idol... Getting the extra card, oh my. That is awesome. See, that that's a big pickup now because it's it's the double value that you're getting from Fandral here. And so they're making back up this card economy. They're able to check the early board state. Curator. Not I'm looking terrible. At, I'm kind of looking at Jungle Panther. Yeah, you'll, oh, well, you need a three drop, so that actually makes perfect sense. Honestly, it's it's not too bad here either because one of the one of the ways that Shaman makes sure that they keep board presence is just by killing your thing when you play a weak one. Jungle mm -hmm. Panther having stealth means that rolling into an Azure Drake turn, it can attack it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you happen to run into, in this game, they're going to be running into Flame Reef Face at some point. Having a Jungle Panther on board means that a single Wrath is going to take it out there. Yep. Absolutely. That's a great point. Um, and I guess what they're debating about, the Curator can pull an Azure Drake for yourself. Uh, all right. So Wrath and Starfall. If that Fandral lives for the next turn, then Wrath is fantastic. I'm, I'm going to venture to say Fandral's not sticking around. Here's but the thing, Mark of Yasharaj 
on that jungle panther. I, I was thinking about, they did choose to go with Starfire here instead of Wrath, which is really interesting. Um, right now, it feels like St. Louis Farm could have been in the driver's seat for this game. And taking the Starfall is more of a, a recovery mechanic than mm -hmm. when you're ahead. I mean, it's certainly a lot weaker in your head because you're just dictating the trades on your own. Kind of interesting. So St. Louis Farm going into turn three. This is the reason they took the Jungle Panther. Works oh really my. nicely. An Innervate pickup for them would be so fantastic on the following turn. You see even the way it's panning out. Meyer Keeper for the acceleration into Violet Teacher and Power of the Wild. They they have a driving force right now, and UIT is going to need something big if they're going to pull back into this one. And the stealth is it's it's kind of a really exemplifying what I was talking about here. The Sphere Clause is going to prevent that from being traded into. And Runic so important. Egg from the Maelstrom Portal. When that dies, it will draw UIT one card. Um, but honestly, if you don't have any buffs. Uh, you have the, fl uh, the Flame Tongue Totems, but St. Louis Farm can really just leave that alone for now. It doesn't even challenge the Panther. I think it's funny that Starfall's taken and Runic gets dropped from the Maelstrom Portal. That is kind of funny. And the Starfall, of course, can be used for five damage on one target, um, which may yeah. even be more likely in this matchup. Which is, is certainly what they're focusing on, I think, when they take the Starfall to begin with, is, is the potential to line it up against Fire Elemental or Thing from Below. Mm -hmm. The land serves me. Yeah, it's very flexible. Yeah, this Jungle Panther's staying, staying put right now. He's prowling around. Yeah, with the Spirit Claws attached, you want to ensure value from that. Four damage to the face would be nice, but... It would be eight damage. But his, his, yeah, his but damage is what you need right now. There's thing, I think one of the considerations here is, um, like, another Maelstrom Portal. Mm -hmm. But I don't think four damage... I don't think the eight damage is worth that, personally. I think that being able to buy a trade on the board with that card is, is a strong investment from it. St. Louis Farm decides that they're not yet uh, in a position to be that aggressive uh, and decides to save the Jungle Panther in stealth. UOIT on five mana has the Azure Drake, but that will get easily killed by the Jungle I Panther. <laughs> I mean, you're seeing what a problem it is. It's What, what is UOIT going to do? The card's pretty good. Jungle Panther is just Ninja Huffer. Ninja Huffer. <laughs> just comes down. He's, he's going to attack for four. That's true. He just, he just got to wait a turn. He's a patient stealth cat hunter. I feel, feel like stealth is such a, like, I can see it there. Mm -hmm. I know it's there. Yeah, but it's not really there. Your eyes deceive you, admirable. And stealth is really a mechanic that we actually don't see a lot of nowadays. Taunt is very common. Charge was oppressive for a while. And stealth just, Stuffing you kind stealth. of forget that it's there. <laughs> stealth cards are bad. Not this time. Jungle Panther's pretty good. I think Azure Drake actually might be a little bit stronger in the Violet Teacher turn here. Um, if you look at the way their hand is building up, being able to just scale an Ancient of War, force something from your opponent, and then wait for just more spells for the Violet Teacher, I think could set them in a better position. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, Violet Teacher and Power of the Wild is more mana efficient this turn, and you do get a pretty significant value from it because of your board state. So, would not be surprised in the least to see it. Uh, but Azure Drake, I think, is, is offering some, some very strong potential here. You could also save the Azure Drake. Uh, I can see combining it with spells later in the game. Can Obviously, swipe class? is you know the the best case scenario. You're still a few turns off from that. You don't have it in the hand at this point. So I, I think the Violet Teacher Power of the Wild is almost a little bit too good to pass up at this point. Honestly, th this is a really weird spot because I wouldn't mind to see a trade on onto the Runic here. And, and I know that sounds kind of crazy, but. Well, Flame Tongue Totem's a very real possibility. Yeah, that, that's that's where I'm thinking, too. Now, I don't necessarily think they're going to do that, but... I mean, here it's only threatening a 2-2, so you just would leave the stealth. But they are... They're, I mean, they're really considering that attack. I like it. I think it's a strong... It's very smart. I think it's a strong move from St. Louis Farm. And there's the Flame Tongue, so they would have had that trade potential. Uh-oh. Could that change things? Ah, the Vot Teach at 4-6. UOIT does not have seven mana, so the only way to get that spell damage would be the Wrath of Air Totem, uh, which would mean that they're not developing really anything else on this turn. Yeah, I, it kind of in hindsight, actually, wa watching the way that they attacked here, I, I think this is a lot stronger. I think the Violet Teacher oftentimes forces a Hex in this spot, and when that happens, it opens up the opportunity for Ancient of War. And when Ancient of War is not facing Hex, it, it is backbreaking to the Shaman. I mean, it's very tough to push through an Ancient of War when you're relying on board presence and combat damage to get it done. So, in hindsight, I think this the Bioteacher play is just way stronger. 
They do get that spell damage totem. Uh, the Violet Teacher, however, not removed just from the Maelstrom Portal and the Spirit Claws. A dance indeed, St. Louis Farm will. Swash Burglar is a man of many talents. And on top of that, he can dance. Looks like he's on the set of uh, HCT. <laughs> yeah, is he like right behind us? <laughs> None of these barrels actually have the uh, Hearthstone logo on them, though, so that's unfortunate. Yeah, Azure, Azure Drake, I think, is, is still really appealing here. Getting the extra token from Violet Teacher alongside the Wrath. I think the question here is is which one do you Wrath? I, I think I would tend to go for the Swash Burglar here to keep Violet Teacher outside of range of Spirit Claws. At the same time, if, that's if you the wrath case, away the totem, then... And if that's the case, I think just hero power is better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, allows you to clear the board. Uh, and once again, this Violet Teacher is potentially uh, going to warrant a Hex. At, at this point, Yo IT can drop the Flame Wreath, Faceless, and the Hex on the same turn. Curious if the Mana Tide is okay alongside it as well. It kind of gives your opponent like a fork in the road. Which mm -hmm. one do you kill? Yeah. It's an interesting turn. I mean, UIT's, honestly, their their options are just fairly poor, though. And if St. Louis Farm is forced to decide, do they want to kill the Flame Wreath or the Mana Tide? Uh, if they kill both, then they have to forego the Ancient of War this turn. With the Emperor Thoris on, however, it's still a really good amount of development. Hmm. I just, I'm not seeing a way to really get back into this one. Well, let's see they what they pick up. A lot of cards. Uh, Thunderbluff Valiant is certainly not one of them right now. Not going to do it. They've already used both Maelstrom Portals. Uh, no Lightning Storm, and with the Flame Wreath Faceless in hand, I'm inclined to believe well, something had to be taken out of the deck. Well, pretty straightforward turn for St. Louis Farm. Emperor Thoris on Wrath to answer the Azure Drake and continue the assault at this point. St. Louis Farm, I believe, has gotten all the information they need. And a turn that week, I think, spells it out. And UIT is down to to very few reasonable options. St. Louis Farm very potentially coming back into this series with a 2-2 tie. Uh, Yo IT needs to address this board immediately, and it doesn't look like they really can. Yeah, there are no options for doing that right now. I mean, it, the Hex is just very low value at this point. The Emperor Thoris on uh, activations, I feel, are are fairly inconsequential at this point. Mm -hmm. Your opponent's just likely to have a strong follow-up, kind of regardless of what you do. We've seen that Flame Wreath Faceless in hand this entire time, forming a 7-7, seeming like such a, such a strong stat line. Um, but really, now we're kind of understanding why it's not being seen played very much at this point in time. It's, it's awkward. I mean, St. Louis Farm did get off to an incredible start this game. But this is what happens when Druid gets those strong starts. It is, it is a force to be reckoned with. Absolutely. Of, of nature, some would say. A force of nature to be reckoned with. Poor force of nature. Still see it off of Raven Idols occasionally. And why not? Innervate to ensure the Ancient of War drop as well. You just saw Hex. Starfire is six damage at the moment with Azure Drake. Everything is St. Louis Farm. We're, I think we're, we are going to game number five, Cora. I think we are. The second five-game series of the weekend. I believe we had one yesterday, and uh, this is going to be the first one for today. Yeah, I mean, Innervate, Starfall, trade off your little student there, eight to face. It's very fitting. I want to see a... I want to see a Tespa skin Violet Apprentice. You know what's the only thing I would have liked to do differently this weekend, Admirable? More college puns. Hmm. Could have been good. Wonder. Just gotta, just gotta find the opportunity for it. Man, I didn't brainstorm enough. I didn't do my homework. <laughs> I didn't study. I, I oh, never no did homework in school. <laughs> I was <laughs> terrible. Don't tell my professors, but I'm like three days behind. Yeah, man. do do your homework. Don't don't be like me. Don't be like me and skip out on your entire midterm week to come. Cast Whoa. Hearthstone, or be like me. It's pretty fun. It's sort of your job. I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's work. It counts. St. Louis Farms take their time making sure that every little bit has been checked across the board. Tunnel Trog, no help. Game five. Coming at you. St. Louis Farm tying up this series 2-2. Two 
going toe to toe with UOIT. The Harrison Jones being found in UIT's deck, I think, could be a big key to this fifth and final game, which will be a Shaman Mirror. But it's this is one of those spots where the mental edge, I think, is a very real thing. When you start up two games to zero, you're feeling like you're on top of the world. When that gets turned around going into game five and a mirror match at that, suddenly the team who was down by two games feels like they're up 2-0 in the series almost. It can really mess with you. And St. Louis Farm, sort of as soon as they got that Warlock out of the way, really has had some incredible momentum. Um, and now that they're you know continuing with that momentum, if this Shaman game even starts a little bit in their favor, then the potential for maybe some mistakes from UOIT, I mean, it, it's impossible to know, but anything can really happen. We've been seeing a lot of Shaman play go to very late in the game. It is, it is not like the days of of aggro shaman where it's flinging burn spells back and forth it is a major resource battle and something that has been really interesting is to watch players kind of force their opponents to use board clear spells in spots where they don't necessarily mm -hmm. want to and and that's been a really big talking point at some point you have to get aoe spells from your opponent so that you can actually get on the board and in order to do that it means you're going to have to expend some stuff fairly aggressively but there's a very fine balance with that a little bit too much you're going to fall behind just not enough, and your opponent goes wide. Yep. All right. Now, two so totem golems can really change that. <laughs> absolutely, but there is a totem golem in St. Louis Farm's hand as well. Uh, so game number five, the Shaman Mirror shaping up already uh, to be a little bit similar. I, I'm actually curious who has the advantage in this matchup, if, if it's the player going first or second, because Coin unlocks some interesting turns, which it oftentimes just expended mm -hmm. early on. But going first means that you have the attacker's advantage. And in a matchup like this one, being able to unlock Flame Tongue Totem first is a big deal. Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, it, to be able to get those favorable trades before your opponent wow. can be huge. But now after the Mulligans, with the addition of that Argent Squire, now it's fucking even more even once again. Yeah, this, this will influence, I think, UIT's first turn here to be Tunnel Trog instead of Totem Golem. Um, they choose to play Totem Golem here, and they run into an opposing one. The Argent Squire plus Totem Golem will clean it up, and they'll mm -hmm. be left facing on a 1-1 and a 3-1. And that, that's kind of a situation I think they don't want to be in. So Tunnel Trog here can kind of kind of push against that. I wonder. Make sure it takes care of the Divine Shield, and then you can follow mm -hmm. up with Totem Golem. Yeah, and it makes their curve you know, that much better. Tunnel Trog into Totem Golem, then on the following turn, you can play the second Totem Golem if you choose. Uh, so it's definitely nicer on your mana. And St. Louis Farm going to play their own Totem Golem. Their turn three, uh, not too much for them to do at this point. And with Thing from Below in UIT's hand tier two, um, I think it's shaping up to, to be really interesting where out, outside of Mana Tide Totem getting an enormous amount of value, I feel like their card economy is going to be a little bit weaker. But do they just have a strong enough board presence that they can overcome that? All right, and St. Louis Farm farm uh, deciding to attack face with the Tunnel Trog there instead of breaking the Divine Shield on the Argent Squire. How do you feel about that, Admirable? It, it certainly seems strange. All right. You know, the, the the idea that you're giving your opponent a 3-1 and a 1-1, I mean, the Maelstrom Portal in hand, I think, is a big influencer to that. <laughs> but I think in this spot, if they choose to attack Divine Shield, it's almost ensuring that St. Louis Farm's Totem Golem will attack the Tunnel Trog instead. So a really interesting spot where I think they're trying to get St. Louis Farm to attack into the Totem Golem so that they can Maelstrom Portal. St. Louis Farm's not going to bite. Nope, and especially with the addition of that Healing Totem, I wouldn't have worked out anyway, but now UOIT going to be able to take out that Totem Golem. Uh, the Argent Squire still left around, however, so that's kind of annoying for them. And, and another really interesting spot for UOIT where the hero power represents a 50% chance to actually protect your totem golem if you trade off St. Louis Farms. I wonder. The Stone Claw totem or Healing totem will protect it. Mm -hmm. That's and it's with actually two thing from belows. It's it's really this is a really unique board state. If you were to hero power this turn, not only could you protect your totem golem, but then you could roll into a coin uh, onto the thing from below on the following turn. Actually, you could so just play good. the thing from below on the following turn. You wouldn't even need to use the coin. This should be thing from below for St. Louis Farm. Uh, th the fact that UOIT has expended a second total golem at this point, they're going to be on three mana next turn, and that Flame Tongue Totem would be isolated if they chose to trade up that way. It means that thing from below is is kind of the first step in breaking that that opening board presence. 
All right, and there's a lightning storm that could be very valuable. But you're really hesitant to use it now. And, and you asked, Admirable, early on, who has really the advantage when you have very similar looking hands um, and one player has the coin. And in this case, it has been St. Louis Farm because they picked up the Argent Squire on turn one and then were able to continue the pressure from there. So UOIT hasn't found a good turn to use that coin to try and give themselves better value on board than St. Louis Farm. Uh, so ultimately, being able to curve out from turn one has benefited St. Louis Farm. Yeah, they're hoping that this thing from below will just straight up contest on the other side of the board. And this is kind of what ends up happening when you have one player having that attacker's advantage is they're the ones in the driver's seat very often. And, and this spot, I think, is pretty fantastic for St. Louis Farm. They have the ability to just build more board tension. They can just trade off straight away. They could choose to expend a hex here and try to snowball the board position. They have, they have everything right now. Yep. So this Zero is going to spell hex. Hex the thing from below. Uh, Argent Squire into the Frog, and then you can trade your thing from below into the Totem Golem. Healing Totem even will heal it back up to three health, meaning that Lightning Storm isn't a guaranteed kill on it. Yeah, I think th this position, I think, is about as strong as, as St. Louis Farm could have hoped for, um, and this will likely force the, force the first board clear. But if you think about the value that St. Louis Farm has gotten from just this board alone, the Lightning Storm... Is, is certainly trying to play recovery. It's not a big swing turn. Mm -hmm. It is simply to make sure you don't I lose the game. There. Yeah, combined with something like a very cheap thing from below, then the Lightning Storm could potentially be a very large board swing, but unfortunately for them, they haven't had the liberty of being able to hero power enough this game. And that thing from below is still four mana. Yeah, the, oh. the other thing to consider here too is that UIT still is at 28. And something Shaman's really good at is stabilizing at a, at a fairly dangerous life total, mm -hmm. especially in a matchup like this one where the board presence is necessary. You know, if they just choose to continue building the totem count, they can eventually roll into a Blood Mage Lightning Storm Maelstrom Portal turn and completely clear board position away. But here they're gonna go with Blood Mage and Maelstrom Portal uh, simply to just isolate the thing from, I'm sorry, the thing from below and just try to keep pressure on it this way. I don't mind this at all because they're sacrificing five life here to keep a very important tool. And a Flame Wreath Faceless coming into the hand of St. Louis Farm as well. Uh, apparently not as unusual in these builds as we had initially thought. It's certainly favored by, by some players still. I mean, uh, it, it's still a lot of stats for a relatively low amount of mana. And, and in a matchup like this one, I think it's really important to have something that can force Hex from your opponent. Yeah, especially for only four mana. And if you're playing those Tunnel Trogs, then... Makes more sense that way, too. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder... So St. Louis Farm now has to decide, uh, do they want to push face, I think, which makes a lot of sense here. Um, I can't really see them trading. Unless you really want to ensure that that Blood Mage Thalnos is off the board. Uh, pushing face for five damage just makes a lot of sense. Especially when you're developing, you know, seven seven worth of stats as well. Yeah, and here's a here's a really interesting spot again for UIT where the trade on the thing from below means that they're gonna have option to try to protect the mana tie totem. And I think this is a way for them to certainly get back in this game. The, the way that they have dedicated their resources, they weren't so concerned with their life total that they overspent what they had. And because of that, now they're finding themselves in a spot where getting back in this game is very realistic. And if they had they done this any other way, they might have just fallen out of the game. But they still have to address that flame wreathed faceless. Uh, it's in part with the thing from below. The thing from below is almost certainly going to draw an attack mm -hmm. from it, and then they can follow up with fire elemental that they just picked up. This, you know, that pickup was a big one. Other than that, they had lightning storm to try to fight against St. Louis Farm, mm -hmm. developing a wide board state to again try to contest the manatee totem. Absolutely, and, and with that thing from below down, that manatee totem very well could get two draws. Um, the <laughs> hex, however, I think there's a chance he hexes the manatee totem here. Like, you think that thing is scary right now. Again, this is a battle of resources. It's not so much a battle of aggression. You know, being able to have a threat on board means that you could push the issue, but that's being checked at every step of the way. If you hex the thing from below, your opponent's getting another draw from manatee totem. If they can check your thing from below after that, they're getting another draw from manatee totem. That, that is a snowballing effect. Is hex even? required this turn though because if you just play azure drake kill the thing from below uh then you still have the hex in reserve for thunderbluff valiant or fire elemental which I'm, is i am terrified really necessary. i personally if i'm in st louis farm spot i'm terrified of this mana tide totem mm -hmm. um and, and, and hexing it's not where you want to be and, and that's what i mean by force like they, they may feel forced to hex it they're gonna go with thunderbluff valiant instead 
And UIT certainly has some draws that can really be gas in a situation like this. Absolutely. And with Fire Elemental, there's a second Fire Elemental. Uh, you drop the first one, kill off the Flame Wreath Faceless, and that directly challenges that Thunder Bluff Valiant. Yep. And a second draw for the Manatide Totem is going to occupy the attack from Thunder Bluff Valiant very likely in a spot like this. Absolutely. And then if St. Louis Farm is able to build up their board even larger, UOIT has Spell Damage plus Lightning Storm to try to break it back down. Just a tough spot. The game is steadily swinging into UOIT's favor. I mean, Fire Elementals are, are a big part of that, but I think the Mana Tide has been one of the biggest factors so far in the game. And again, this wouldn't have been possible had they had they overspent on the Lightning Storm. The fact that they used Maelstrom Portal to sacrifice mm -hmm. some life was, was a beautiful turn. Now, second Thunder Bluff Valiant is certainly an interesting draw. So you need to remove Mana Tide. Hex the Fire Elemental, and then with five mana remaining, Azure Drake or Thunder Bluff Valiant? I think he wants to, he's got to get some totem presence on the board. I mean, you, you already have Thunder Bluff Valiant out, and you yeah. need to buy some value from it. You want that totem presence, but at the same time, the first Thunder Bluff Valiant wasn't removed, meaning that the second one likely will not be either. And you want that resilient board presence. It's hard to say even more than the totems, maybe. I think I'd like to see the Blood Mage and the Tunnel Trog here. The Blood Mage is going to replace itself. I don't think it's paramount that you couple the the spell power right now. I think that they need options um, because they, they are behind in hand right now, and the board presence is still a little bit shaky. Yes, they do have Thunder Bluff Valiant, but I don't necessarily think this is the strongest board state that they could be hoping for. So UOIT ahead on cards. And definitely a head on card quality as well. That's important to note. But the Azure Drake and St. Louis Farm's hand, as well as the Blood Mage, will replace themselves. There's another Fire Elemental to check, or to attempt to check a Thunder Bluff Valiant. And St. Louis Farm draws a way to protect it. That's that's important Very right now. Nice. But UIT ret can return that with, with Azure Drake and Lightning Storm. This is a really tough spot for St. Louis Farm that's coming up. I think they've fought really hard for the board so far, but. Um, I'm not sure it's going to get there at this point. Without board clears of their own, it's just, I don't believe, going to be possible. And again, like you were saying, this all came down to the fact that that Manatai Totem was able to get multiple draws for UOIT, putting that second Lightning Storm in their hand, allowing them to dig deeper into their deck and stay relevant in this game. So, although the team that had uh, the attacker's initiative seemed better off in the beginning, now it's sort of flipped to the other side. Uh, Partly on the use of some really smart area of effect removal with that Maelstrom Portal. It's been, it's been really important to watch like how the game ends up panning out when one, te when one player has Lightning Storm, or one team in this instance has Lightning Storm, and the other team doesn't. Lightning Storm, for the longest time, we weren't even seeing in Shaman decks. It's always been a very efficient form of removal, uh, but for a long time it was unnecessary to even attempt to get back on board oh, in many occasions because with the aggro shaman you were just dealing that lethal damage from hand yeah it's just just a meta game consideration lightning storm was just was was lining up very poorly and, and a lot of people are playing totem shaman it suddenly lines up very well really well so uoit has access to azure drake lightning storm they do end up leaving one mana it's a little bit awkward arts and squire gets drawn as well that'll hit the board and Azure Drake lives through the Lightning Storm is very important because that checks the other Azure Drake from UOIT. It allows Spirit Claws to take care of the Fire Elemental. That Azure Drake living was so important for them. That was absolutely pivotal for St. Louis Farm to have even a chance of coming back into this game. Uh, now they have to do this correctly, yes. So Spirit Claws into the Fire Elemental, uh, the Drakes trade, and then they are able to build back up that board presence again. Yeah, this is part of the attacker's advantage too, is even when your opponent can swing the board, you do have ways to recover against that. And I, and I think I think dropping the Tunnel Trog here is, it, it, I can see it going either way. In, in one vein, you just saw a Lightning Storm from your opponent. Uh, on the other side of it, if you run into another Lightning Storm, are you gonna lose your Tunnel Trog as a result? So they're gonna choose to develop it here and just hope to get the presence rolling in UOIT. Uh, certainly falling a little bit behind, but Flame Tongue Totem can buy them back some of this board position, but the, the Thunder Bluff Valiant has to be checked. 
holding on to that tunnel trog I don't think benefits you at all this way. Anyway, you don't have any overload in hand. The one three body not going to be incredibly effective, so you might as well put it on board uh, after you've seen the first lightning storm. I don't think there's any problem with this. Now, UOIT does have the option uh, to roll for the Wrath of Air Totem, play the Flame Tongue as well as the Lightning Storm, potentially clear off that board once again. Um, but it's it's difficult. This is, again, kind of a weird turn. I get it. Yeah, a, re a relatively inconsequential roll here, but kind of regardless of the way the numbers pan out, they will have a way to kill Thunderbolt Valiant. And suddenly the second Lightning Storm, of course you can see how important that card is in this matchup. St. Louis Farm is now in a heap of trouble. Absolutely. So suddenly they just... Oh, that's the worst draw oh, in the deck right now. Man, they have no cards in hand that really do anything at this point. Well, Blood Mage, uh, the Spirit Claws can kill that Flame Tongue Totem. So that's removing that much power off the of board. And then the Blood Mage cycles. So it still doesn't mean anything because YoIT has Flamery Faceless and Thunderbluff Valley into hand. Yeah, that, that's really the big one here is that when it came down to the resource battle, St. Louis Farm was applying pressure with, uh, with Thunderbluff Valiants and with Flamery Faceless. UIT was at the liberty of answering with Fire Elementals and Lightning Storms. And so when it comes to the priority threats at the end of the game, UIT has them available still, where St. Louis Farm has already expended them. And this is where the snowball begins. Maelstrom Portal not going to be enough by itself. And Second Flamery Faceless also just a little bit slow, unfortunately. This is going to require spell checked. power and then Bye. require a Maelstrom Portal. Good roll and then Flamery Faceless. They don't get the uh, Wrath of Air Totem. And the issue compounds. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 damage available for you, OIT. And a wealth of options in hand. Drake first, see what you get. Follow it up with the Trog and the Flame Ring Faceless if you have to. It's a perfect use of the 10 mana, and it's a strong board. I, I, I feel so I feel so much for St. Louis Farm in this spot, too. I mean, they fought so hard to come back to this point. And in this game, I think their execution was even was even very strong. And the fact that UIT was able to hide a Mana Type Totem, the fact that they had multiple AOE spells, Just they were so close to, to bringing it all yeah. the way back. That's, that's it's heartbreaking, especially when you work this hard and you fight this hard to come back into the match from an 0-2 deficit. You tie back up the series, and then, unfortunately, sometimes you're just at the liberty of your draw. And in this case, they did not get the area of effect removal that they needed. Uh, so UOIT probably wants to hero power here, put those large totems into play. Totems are killing a Flame Wreath Faceless. Just yeah, totems. You don't, you don't see that very often. Um, and then Trog, Flame Wreath Faceless. And St. Louis Farm does not come back from this. Oh, God. Especially not with yeah, that. Yeah, back, back to back to back. Poor draws for St. Louis Farm at the end of the game. Again, they've used a ton of their resources at this point, but that was the that was the way the battle panned out. It was the resource battle once again, and UIT came out very much on top of this one. So they do actually get kind of a delay here by getting multiple taunts, but um, it's it's fairly futile at this point. Everything is, is still going to snowball for UIT. It's good to see a Goldshire Footman, though. <laughs> he, he looks very battle-ready. That Goldshire Footman Twitter guy had a heyday when Maelstrom yeah. Portal came out. <laughs> that was some good stuff. Uh, but unfortunately for him, he's on the board only to be swiftly removed from the board. I feel like he should be a lot stronger than 1-2. I mean, just look at him. He's That's got that a armor. one two. He's got the beard, which you know, you're a fan of, clearly. You can probably respect a fellow bearded man. Just saying. All right, Harrison Jones not even going to be necessary. Uh, certainly a nice option, though, especially in this matchup. Now, pay the life as you see fit. It does not matter all too much. Well, to trade the, the Tunnel Trog into the Stone Claw Totem after you hit the 5-2 would strictly be a mistake. So I, I think I'd like to see them <laughs> run the Thunderbluff Valiant it's in. Just, they're bragging at this point is what they're doing. A little bit of uh, some bad manners play. Now they're going to go ahead and run in the Thunderbluff Valiant. Uh, it's actually still just a mistake if they want to go ahead and clear off the Flame Tongue. I don't think they anticipated uh, attacking Flame Tongue Totems here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, This is certainly superior. Very defensive play. Um, but I mean, at this point, you can't really there lose to any single card. Options. So 
you might as well clear off the board and ensure your victory instead of ending the game potentially one turn earlier. A little D2 action over here. Just roll the top turn after turn. <laughs> after turn. <laughs> uh, and they can lightning bolt the Thunder Bluff Valiant away. Still 7, 10, 14 on board for UOIT. If they do, that's uh, one damage off lethal. Well, they have the Spirit Claws as well. Yeah, well, if they Lightning Bolt the Thunder Bluff Valiant, Spirit Claws into the Stone uh, Claw Totem, 7, 10, 14. I got you. I got you. Oh, there's two for Oh, the, there's the yeah, Stone yeah. Claw Totem. Yeah, well, all right, that's lethal. Valiantly fought from St. Louis Farm to bring it back to game number five, but falling by the hand of Lightning Storms. And speaking of hands, high fives all around for the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. All right. That's what that sign said. Hashtag RDU. Um, <laughs> I don't feel like it's too soon at this point. It's been years since that. Uh, but yeah, a fantastic performance, honestly. Like, I think St. Louis Farm did everything they could to try to bring this one back. But at the end of the day, the Reno Warlock deck suffering two losses, I think just set them far, far enough behind that it, it really hurt their chances in this one. But still a valiant effort. Yeah, if they had had a second chance with that Shaman deck, I think that they actually could have taken this series, you know, very easily. But that Warlock suffering a little bit in the early game, putting them in an early 2-0 deficit. And unfortunately, they were unable to bring it back and make the series their own. So University of Ontario Institute of Technology going to go up to a 2-0 record overall in this tournament. Yeah, and it's off to a great start. Like you said, uh, you need four wins to make it to the playoff stage. And they're halfway there at this point. There uh, are no teams eliminated from contention so far. There are some teams that are 0-2, teams that are 1-1, one, one, teams that are 2-0. But a 4-2 or better record will put you into the playoff stage. So still every single team competing with a chance to still take the entire thing home. So that's, that's our third and final match for the day. Uh, and we're going to have to be joined next week as we roll into these. Cora, it has been such a fantastic couple days of matches here. Admirable. I always enjoy casting with you. And to be able to come on for my first broadcast of the collegiate tournament, uh, especially when, you know, college and Hearthstone is so close to my life right now, it's so close to my heart. And to be able to see these guys perform so well has been really an incredible time. It, it certainly is awesome to watch aspiring players compete for scholarships and, and try to help move their way along through a college career. You know, that's the dream is when you're doing something you love and you could get a, a prize and glory from it. There's just, there's, it's nothing quite like it in Hearthstone, I'd say. Absolutely. This is certainly a unique tournament format, a uh, unique set of players, and I can only imagine what the next several weeks have to bring, but I think it's probably going to be pretty great. Yeah, so let's go ahead and take a look at what we have in store for you next week. There are plenty more action, there's plenty more action to come uh, as far as Hearthstone is concerned with the Collegiate Hearthstone Training Grounds Tournament. They'll be playing for multiple weeks of it. Of course, you can see it here. Arkansas yesterday was uh, unable to take the match versus Baylor as they were up 3-0. The University of Texas took down Rice in a very close nail biter. And then with the help of Dutes 7597, Washington was able to defeat Arizona State. And then of course today, Princeton took it 3-1 over TCNJ. Uh, Brown was able to take it over the University at Albany three games to one. And we just saw the match take place right now in the five game set nail biter. But uh, I think it's going to do it for us uh, this week. Uh, you know, just incredible matches, and uh, we'd love to know your thoughts on what, you, on what you've seen so far and who you're supporting and all that jazz. You can check us out on Facebook. You can tweet at Team Tespa. And if you'd like to have more information about how you could potentially compete in one of these seasons, you can visit Tespa.org. We also want to take this time to thank those who have made this possible. We are powered by Twitch here, and a special thanks to Gunner and Steel Series for being sponsors for these scholarships these guys are competing for. So for everyone here at the studios in Burbank, for myself and for Cora, thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you next week.